What is up, everybody? It is 4 o'clock on Monday, January 8th, 2024. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, brother. <laughs> My man. Uh, this is the Burn Pit Podcast. I am your host, Scott Benjamin Sieverts. To my right, as always, Matt Wakulik, Matty Wack. What's up, brother? What's going on, man? Dude, first show of the year. Yeah, first one first of the year. That is correct. It's exciting. It's, it's just awesome. getting better from here. I love it. We had a uh, we went, we went out with a bang last in 2023. We did. Uh, we had some big names on. Yeah. We had some good uh, good guests, but you're watching us live here on Spreely TV. We're coming to you from Studio Me here in Pittsburgh, PA. Spreely TV is your free speech network. Uh, it is a free speech advocacy network. Uh, it stands for Speak Freely. You can find Spreely on Roku, Apple, Fire Stick. You can download the Freedom Hub app right on your phone or smart device. Just go to the App Store, type in Freedom Hub. And it is free. It costs you nothing. And it helps support podcasts just like this. So we, all, we always appreciate the love and support that we get. Uh, Spreely's been really good to us, dude. We finished the year. I'm just going to read some names yeah, off. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Listen, since we got on the Spreely Network, you ready for this? Max Talbot, <laughs> yep. Ian Smith, Sean Casey, John Burke, Paul Spadafora, Cody Alford. I mean, Travis Neville. The list goes on. Jack Donovan's up. Your uh, the episode with Jack Donovan's up. Our episode with the ATF is up on Spreely. Yep. It was awesome, man. It was awesome. All right. Well, while we're waiting for our guests to come in, we're just going to get things rolling here. Uh, we got some interesting topics to discuss. Interesting uh, things going on in the news uh, yeah. today. Obviously, the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict is um, still going on. You have countries that are suing Israel for crimes against humanity. That is true. Um, you have uh, Trump is taken off the ballot in Colorado. Then he got put back on. Yeah, the Supreme Court's going to. Uh, hear that case maine took him off the ballot as well mm. i don't know if, if you're the constitutional expert is that the uh, is that something that's well it it does say that they can um the states are allowed to run the their voting the way they want to but i don't know if they're allowed to actually exclude somebody from being put on the ballot you know how they run their primaries different like pennsylvania uh let's just take south carolina for instance south carolina has an open primary which means you could be a Democrat registered. I can be a Republican. However, when it comes to the primary, me and you can vote for anybody. Okay. You, the Democrat, can vote for the Republican guy oh. in, the in the primary. And as a Republican, I can vote for a Democrat. Now, in Pennsylvania, you cannot vote for a Republican if you are a Democrat. You have to change your party label. Okay. And I, I don't know what the time frame is. I think you give it like two or three weeks. So in, time. In, let's say in 2020, had I <clears throat> wanted to say vote for Cory Booker. Mm hmm. Uh, but I'm a registered Republican well, in the state of Pennsylvania. I wouldn't have been it able would be to, the primary. So the be primary, your, right. Yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't have been able to do that. In the primary leading up to the 2020. In your election. state voting for that person within your, you have to be that, regi you have to be registered. Yeah, that. Under that party. So anyone who's an independent, if there's no independents running, you have to change your party label uh, for the primary. Now, general election, it doesn't matter. You can, like president, you can vote for whoever you want or whatever. Gotcha. But in a primary, you have to be that party label to, to vote for that particular person in that party. Okay. That's just the state of Pennsylvania. Like I said, every, every state has you're correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. We got the Epstein client list out. Well, we don't have the client list. You have the, the court client, documents. The, the, the court documents, but there's a list of names that came out here on uh, the documents. On yes. the documents, yeah. There's 90 different names. I got an article here from uh, Newsweek. Mm -hmm. You got. Well, can I just read it to you? Go I'll ahead. Yeah, go ahead. We'll start off with this. All right. After weeks of speculation and anticipation. Many of the names of former associates, employees, friends, and victims of deceased sex offender Jeffrey Epstein have been released. The names were unsealed from a lawsuit filed by Virginia Guffrey, an alleged trafficking victim against British socialite Jilzane Maxwell, Epstein's former girlfriend. Maxwell, 61, is serving a 20-year prison sentence after she was convicted in December of 21. Dude, it's been two years since her conviction. Yeah, so her Holy father crap. was an Israeli spy for the Mossad, That's Robert correct. Maxwell. That's, that is correct. People, a lot of people don't know that. No. We'll break down the Epstein operation here as we wait for our guests to get in. Uh, so she was convicted in December of 21 yeah. of helping Epstein recruit and sexually abuse underage girls. Right. Uh, many of the who, those whose names appear on the documents released Wednesdays aren't accused of wrongdoing or have been mentioned previously in legal proceedings or n news accounts. The documents released Wednesday are not an Epstein client list. 
So I'm sorry, I misspoke. You're right. Yeah. In right. Uh, December, U.S. District uh, Judge Loretta Preska found no legal justification for continuing to withhold the names, as many as 175 individuals allegedly connected with Epstein, ordering the unsealing to begin January 1st. There are 90 names included in the documents, with four redacted. It's, I'm, I'm interested to hear uh, what, you, what you think or who the redacted names are. Well, I think I can put it all together. What do what, you mean redacted names? And what do you mean like they they blacked out? Okay, they blacked out these names and these right. Documents. They're probably sitting <laughs> presidents or senators. Well, the funny thing about need. it is, so how about the list is in alphabetical order? Yeah, you want you ready for this? Yeah, here's uh, well, just, just give me some. T- well, I'm gonna name, they're all ninety. Well, I'm gonna, no, I'm gonna okay. name a couple names in this particular okay. area. Okay. Then the redacted name, and then the name after it. Okay. And all you gotta do is go. Well, the list the list is in alphabetical order. Right. All right. Okay. Uh, we got uh, James Michael Ostrich. Okay. You have Philip Barden, then redacted name, and then Kate Blanchett. So somewhere between A and L, there's a B. With maybe an E next to it or an I, a by, by, by done? I don't know. That could possibly be, that would make sense to have the sitting president not be on that list. But then you have other redacted names here in the G section. They didn't black out Al Gore's name. You, you look down the list, you got Al Gore. Al Gore's on the list? He's on the list. Fred uh, Graff. No, this is Phil, just in court Phil, transcripts, right? This isn't anything else but the names mentioned. Correct. Go down to W. Huh. Uh, all right, W-E-X. I'll, anything there? Oh, okay. Well, it's, what, what are you saying? Donald Trump's on the list. Well, well, of course Donald Trump's on the list. Well, he was on Epstein's plane through the flight logs and court documents that we've known for years at least seven times. Yeah. Bill Clinton, I believe, was 27 times. The funny thing is both of them, nobody has any evidence, at least evidence that has been put out yet, that either one of them were on Epstein's Island. Only that they were on the flight logs on Lolita Express, which was Jeffrey Epstein's private jet. Both of them were on it. Of course, you have <laughs> you have the people on the right, like the, the Trump cultists. Clinton's guilty. He was definitely there. Well, well, Trump was on seven times. Well, he was no way. He kicked him out of his Mar-a-Lago uh, you know, uh, hotel. He's on his plane seven times, but... He's yeah. innocent of everything. Right. Of course he is. Well, people get married to those uh, yeah. their their leaders, especially their party. Yeah. We talked about that before. It's a, it's a more of a team sport. That's correct. So it's is is any of this route now? Again, they put out the information already that, and this is the court documents. There, there's no wrongdoing. There's no crimes being accused of Trump or Clinton. Both of them, and both of them to this day, both. Um, it, they both claim that they weren't on Epstein. Now, even Clinton said I wasn't on his island. Hmm. So, okay. Right. So right now well, we don't know anything other than what we've already known for years. Most of us, well, people like me who have been studying this have known this for years already. But a lot of people think this is like news. People that are watching this that don't know the background. The, of it. I, I argue with people years ago, like you know, Trump has been on Epstein's plane. His court documents, flight logs. Right. No way, man. No way. And I'm like, yeah, and I show him the information. That's bullshit. And now it's coming out that he was. So. Who was uh, Jeffrey Epstein? Who was he? Well, uh, again, he was a... Who was uh, Maxwell? Who are these He, he was like, a, uh, uh, I think it was a hedge fund manager, except for he only had one client. Oh, yeah? Yes. Who was it? Leslie Wexner, ah. the CEO of Victoria's Secrets, which, by the way, he was at his compound in Columbus, Ohio, him and Maxwell, um, which is a very heavily guarded compound by the way which a, a, a girl named maria farmer who anybody can look at you can read or or you can uh go to e- even on youtube i believe but you can go to bit shooter odyssey she has a two-hour interview with whitney webb who is like a, a journalist um and she interviewed her maria farmer was on the compound with epstein she gives her whole story she even tried to press charges through the fbi but it, they just weren't accepting it at the time and this is back in the late 90s early 2000s i believe and uh the stuff that she said i encourage everybody to listen to whitney webb's interview with maria farmer and she was on the compound with both of uh both maxwell and epstein and, and this is Wexner's compound, by the way. This is the Victoria's Secret owner on his compound. And um, there's a lot of chilling stuff in those interviews. And I, I encourage everybody to uh, listen to those interviews. They see $600 million worth of his assets. $600 million. Yeah. 
but where's this money coming from? He's working for one company, and he's got six hundred million dollars. Right. So it's known now, as a lot of us has known in the past, that he is a Mossad asset. Okay. Jeffrey Epstein was. Yes, even what's, what's Mossad? He, right? what's well, Mossad? Mossad is the CIA, basically, of the Israeli government. Okay, it's, 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 it's the equivalent to the C- correct. So what um, what Epstein was doing was he was getting high profile individuals, heads of state from all over the world, mainly Western countries, West, Western European countries in America, um, could be presidents. Uh, uh, senators representatives high profile individuals now what they would do was they would bring them in have them have sex with prostitutes or little children right it's on a separate island even his new jersey residence which was sold to him by leslie wexner for one dollar so he gave them all this stuff now they would blackmail uh, high profile individuals which is what is on the list you look at the list big, so big the tax. israeli government yeah. can have this type of control over the governments of other countries. You have leaders, whenever, leaders on there. Correct. So what they would do Big is... Jack Hollywood, now, I, Again, even Charlie Kirk is talking about this. Everyone's talking about this. It's not like conspiracy anymore. Right. And a lot of us knew this already. Well, if at you one point it up. was. At one point it was. Right. But there's... Mo- Ex-Mossad agents have come out publicly and stated this, that he worked for the Mossad, him and Maxwell. So, And that's who they think killed him in his cell was they allowed the Mossad Israeli government to come in and kill him because Epstein was low level. Epstein was just a guy who they would use to get, you know, these profile high profile individuals on his island and have them have sex with children or prostitutes. That way they can blackmail these high profile indiv- individuals, government officials and control uh, western countries governments through the uh, this blackmail operation. How come that hasn't been put out there yet? Well, people are talking about it. I okay. think even Tucker Carlson was talking about it. Again, you have people like Charlie Kirk, who is pro-Israel. He's talking about it. Multiple people were talking about this. It's just now it's coming into play um, that because you have Mossad, ex-Mossad agents coming out admitting this. Um, it's even in Israeli uh, uh, publications. I believe the uh, Times of Israel has come out and, and admitted this. Um, again, you don't you don't know the names yet because the list has not come out yet. And this is my thing that everybody is everyone's been you know masturbating politically to this list and release the list release the list okay well people how do you know they've been sitting on this list for three years how do you know the list that the government's going to give you is the legitimate list how are you going to know that who's going to know the difference whether the names are made up or not whether the names are real or not you know what i mean so no one's even going to know. You have to trust the government that the list is going to be legitimate after three years sitting on it. How come they didn't release it immediately? And this is the whole thing. Every it, it's just it, it doesn't matter because what's anybody going to do about it anyway? Anyway. So that being said, go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, there's a couple other news stories we can t- touch on, or we can keep going on the Epstein thing. I think uh, we this, can do whatever. This is really there's some other really interesting things going on. Uh, have you seen that uh, the incident that happened in Miami uh, over the weekend? The uh, quote unquote alien um, uh, invasion, I guess. I guess that's what's going on. Yeah. Here. All right. Know, right. You want me to read this story? Go ahead. Yeah. It's, it's funny. from the Rolling Stone. Miami police showed up and forced to respond to a disturbance at a downtown open air mall on New Year's Day after reports of teens brawling and setting off fireworks, ultimately arresting four individuals between the ages of 14 and 16. But with the footage of the chaos and dozens of cop cars lined up alongside Bayside Market making the rounds online. In the following days, it wasn't long before uh, a cohort of conspiracists, uh, conspiracists had invented a very different story befitting of the X-Files. Uh, so, all right. You ready? Go ahead. All right. So this is the take. <laughs> this is from, again, this is from the Rolling Stone. Yep. On Friday, Miami Mall trended on uh, X, formerly Twitter, a platform that is owned by Elon Musk. Um, so, here... Uh, what people are speculating, um, conspiracy theorists accounts many favored by the site's algorithm, uh, thanks to their paid verification badges, speculating that heavy police presence indicated a government cover-up. Of what, you ask? Oh, probably some 10-foot aliens or shadow creatures, the term Nephilim, referring to <laughs> mysterious beings mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, yeah. who are sometimes portrayed as giants or fallen angels, also briefly trended on X through a video of such characters were hard to come by. Yeah. Um, what do we think, man? What I do we think know, about I, this? I don't, I don't know. I think it's... Yeah. Did you see how many... Uh, I saw all the cop cars. That's a that's a yeah. big show of force right there. There was a lot, yeah. For kids that are just playing with fire. That's Yes, correct. Yeah. 
So yeah. uh, my head goes to something must something else must have been going on there. Yeah, but we're, how, how are we ever going to know? Right, we're never going to know. No. Now, I wish it was true that there was an alien invasion. That'd be exciting, right? Wouldn't that be exciting, Scotty Sieverts? And this, now, uh, I'm uh, kind of hoping, believe it or not, though, I'd rather prefer, Scott, is a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> That's what I'm hoping for. But you know what? Fuck those, like, fast zombies. Yeah, yeah. Like the 28 days later, you know. You want the... I want the slow ones. It's more fun. Not the World War Z one. They're too fast. We were done. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the slow moving zombies is what I'm trying to hope for. Okay, you don't want the alien invasion. Uh, it's impossible or improbable, maybe. Okay, that okay. guy. Okay. All right. Well, there's a plenty of news stories to get to here. Also, I want to get your take on the Supreme Court uh, thing. Uh, the Supreme Court said Friday that it will decide whether former President Trump's name uh, can appear on primary election ballots. Mm -hmm. uh, scheduling arguments just five weeks from now in a case that will have a major impact on the year's presidential election. Yeah. Uh, Colorado's top court disqualified the Republican frontrunner from the ballot last month, finding that he engaged in an insurrection before <laughs> and during January 6th, attacking the U.S. Yeah. Capitol. Uh, similar arguments have been made to keep Trump off the ballots in mm -hmm. other states. Okay. Um, first of all, I don't think that the Supreme Court's going to allow him to be put on the ballot. If, if it even goes that way, again, constitutionally, it's just like uh, states are allowed to do certain things, but are they allowed to completely eliminate somebody from even having the right to be on the ballot? I, I don't think so, but... Again, uh, it, that's a touchy situation. But here's why it's irrelevant. In any state, I believe in a union. I, 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 it's at least 48 that I know of. You are allowed to write in a candidate. You can write in anybody you want to. So let's just say your name isn't on the ballot. Oh, Trump's name isn't on. Well, I'm allowed to write him in. Donald Trump. So they can write him in. Right, it doesn't matter. Just as people did for Allegheny County Sheriff a few years ago. <laughs> you write in the name. So you're still allowed to, you're still allowed to vote for him. Yeah. You just write him in. And people will do that. I mean, the Trump cult is huge. They will know that. There will be announced that they can do that. If, in fact, the Supreme Court does not allow, for some reason, his name to be put on a ballot, people just write him in anyway. So what difference does it make? Do you think the Trumpers are... Uh just as bad, if not worse, than some liberals when it comes to like devotion, loyalty. To that, they're worse that because they claim to be like righteous and woke and red pilled, yeah. and you know about the truth, and uh, they're not. You know, right. you bring up all these facts about Trump, which, if you look at his track record, it's far left, as we proved, we have proved it. It's far left. So how can you support, as a conservative, a far left liberal politician with enacted liberal policies and said some far left things on top of that? Yeah. Even to this day, he now supports abortion up to five weeks. Um, you know, he uh, he wants to what he wants to know. I want, we want to put the FBI in a new building. We talked about red flag. Uh he supported red flag. Again, he, he told Congress to come up with a red flag law bill. Even Lindsey Graham and Dan Crenshaw, both Republicans, uh, they supported that. Yeah. And even the NRA, the one spokesperson for the NRA, supported red flag law bills. Um, but regardless of that, he bragged about his ATF under his direction, quote, under my direction, we had more prosecutions in the previous administration. And they did. They had a record number of prosecutions, more than Obama. No, not convictions, but prosecutions, which means he's bragging about it. You've called him tro like a Trojan horse before, like he's a controlled opposition. Well, yeah, but my thing is how can people, which, which is fine, but how can conservatives support that? How can conservatives support this guy who supported anti-constitutional laws? You know, at any point did you uh, support him at all? No, never. never I, I never voted for him. To, I told people not to vote for him the first time. I brought up all of his stuff, you know, before he ran the first time. He supported the Dream Act. He supported the first uh, uh, assault weapons ban. He, he supported abortion. He flip flopped the, on abortion 150 times. Yeah. I, well, also, too, he was on Megyn Kelly and she asked him, oh, Is a trans woman a woman? And he had a hard time answering that one. He wouldn't just. Okay, well, he actually went on public, and this is before the first election, he said, Caitlyn Jenner can use any bathroom in my hotels. So he never, st and he held up an LGBT, you know, rainbow flag on stage. Like, Oh, that wasn't for Noah in the Ark? A foot? Uh, <laughs> the rainbow? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, but, right. uh, you know, also he, um, so he, um, uh, the uh, uh, CPAC, the CPAC route, Lady Maga, she's a trainee. She supported, they allowed her in. They don't allow Nick Fuentes in, but they allow her in. Blair White, another transgender. I don't believe she's cut her thing off, 
But uh, Blair White's another one, right? Conservative. They allow her and they all support her. Alex Jones takes pictures with her. So the, it, yeah. it's, and look, I'm not saying you have to sit there and be like, oh, round up the transgenders and put them in camps. I'm not saying that. But, you know, you have to do that as a conservative, but you don't support that idea. It's not a conservative value, right? Right. So. You know, it, it is what it is. You just don't have conservatism in conservative in the conservative movement today. You want to give? I'll give you a take here. Going back to the 2015, 2016 election. So in June of twenty fifteen, Donald Trump comes down that ex- escalator, announces he's running for president, talks a lot of uh, crap, says you know about building a wall, uh, immigration was a thing he focused on. The other candidates at the time there were seventeen other Republican candidates at the time. Everybody from Governor Scott Walker in Wisconsin, yep. Ted Cruz. I mean, you name it, Rick Grand Perry. Paul, yeah. Uh, there was a, a Carly Fiorina. There was a ton of a ton of people there, mm-hmm. right? So my first take when he he decided to run was, this must be just a publicity stunt. Yeah, that's my that was my first right, right. thing that came to mind. The second thing then, as, it, as the ball kept rolling, he, he did a uh, town hall with Frank Luntz. You know who Frank Luntz is? He's like a pollster, big kind of yeah. Yeah. All right. So here he, he's sitting doing a town hall, and and Trump makes the infamous statement. Uh, about when it came to John McCain, is that I like my prisoners that weren't captured. Yeah. Now, when he said that, mm-hmm. uh, you, people were like, oh, my gosh, how could he you know, possibly say it? And Frank, at the time, once, gave him an opportunity to take it back, and he didn't. Mm-hmm. He doubled down on it, which yeah. is a lesson in politics that people don't know this. There's a couple things that Donald Trump got right when it comes to playing politics, which he, he brought up a bunch, of, which is never apologize for anything. Mm-hmm. Usually, doubling down ends up making you look stronger. When you uh, ko- kowtow, and apologize for something, it makes you look weak. Republicans and uh, uh, what about flip flopping? Is that strength? No, oh, he flip flopped on a ton of stuff. Then. He does, right, he does. But so here, what my first thought of, to, of him was is another Ross Perot here because here he comes on the debate stage, the first debate in September, and it's Brett Baer and it's Megyn Kelly, and the first question they asked was, uh, "Is everybody on stage willing to back the whoever eventually is going to be the Republican?" candidate winner and everybody raised their hands except for Donald Trump so my first thought was this is another Ross Perot this is somebody who for years I thought was friends of the Clintons and he's going to go up against Hillary Clinton Mm -hmm. this is basically this is they're going to usher her in this is her like thing well then he made that infamous statement uh, in the debate where if I was in charge of, of the law in this country you'd be arrested right he said that what about Hillary Clinton yes well he's gonna hire a special prosecutor that's what he said lock her up he said Lock her up. Did he lock her up, Scotty? No. Mm. In fact, he said... He charged her with a crime, though. No. Oh. Nope. Nope. In fact, he hired a special prosecutor. His words were that she had been through enough. That's correct. Right? Yeah. So, and and, uh, of the things that he promised, building a wall, uh, repealing Obamacare... Leave George Soros alone, he said. Yeah. Well, the other thing, too, is in the two years, uh, his first two years that he was in office, they had the Senate and they had the House Mm -hmm. and the executive. Yeah. And he didn't get much done. Well, I, again, you can't just... Uh, technically, you can't... <laughs> of course he didn't. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't run anything. Again, the president isn't in charge. It's the people who donate to your campaign to get you elected. You know, it's the lobbyists, the special interest groups. They're the ones that run. Remember Ted Cruz? Oh, oh, your wife works for Goldman Sachs. How many Goldman Sachs former employees did Trump put in his, his uh, cabinet? Five. 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 It's a joke. Goldman, oh, Goldman Sachs. Well, everyone has so, to bend the knee to th- th- that group. Right. right. So you don't, you're not even really in charge if you're bending the knee. And they all bend the knee. Well, they have to. Otherwise, you get the JFK outcome. Is there anybody <clears throat> that's standing up? Dr. Shiva. Dr. Shiva, which they'll never let him get elected. He won't be put on the ballot. You won't, you're you're not well, going to see him on a debate well, stage either. No, they won't let him. They won't let him. But again, you know, if, even if he did get elected, they give him the JFA, JFK outcome. It's just not going to happen. Whoever gets, whoever is even running, okay, that dwindles down during the primary season because the people are going to obviously pick who they want, right? Right. And they're, they're going to know in the polling. They're going to know in, in the donations, right? Who's donating? These super PACs, all these other political action committees. And, you know, the top lobbying groups and the top political action committees, even the foreign ones that shouldn't be allowed to, <laughs> like APAC, they are the ones who get all the money to your campaigns, including other uh, people, plus the media attention. You got to remember, even the far left media gave Donald Trump 24-7 coverage. 
right? So you're in the media constantly. They're right. not going to put sheep. They didn't. Fox News never ran uh, Ted Cruz that much. They ran Donald Trump. They were ba- They were for him. In the primary in 2016, I voted for Ted Cruz. Yeah, so did I. But even then, he, he's a total cuck now. Now I'm, I'm kind of aware, especially after that election, I, I'm kind of aware. Well, I'm totally aware that it's irrelevant. Voting really changes nothing. It doesn't change anything. Why were you out on Ted Cruz? Curiously. Uh, because of what he's done. I mean, he voted for money for Ukraine. I mean, he's begging money for the uh, government and, and for that Texas um, winter storm. I mean, he, he supports foreign countries more than he supports his own country. You know, he supports anti-First Amendment laws, you know, which he just recently did. Really? But yeah. Well, everyone did, except for Thomas Massey. That's right. We I mean, talked about that. Yeah, they're all, they're, all, they're all scum. Just a handful of people. Even the ones that aren't, like, bought and paid for are just weak. It's irrelevant. Your government isn't run by the people you elect. I think that's been proven. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, but uh, let me read a Spreely plug. Go ahead. And uh, we apologize. Our guest has not uh, come in yet today. But if he can't make it, it's okay. We can reschedule him if he sees this. Uh, not a problem. Um, but here you're watching us on Spreely TV. Spreely is your free speech did, network. Did you? Oh, go ahead. Spreely stands for Speak Freely. Since the beginning of time, the spoken and written word has been the most effective weapon in the defense of personal liberty. Individual freedoms are a gift from God and secured by the right to defend them. This is a basic tenet in a free society. On Spreely, we embrace this notion. We present our audience with the content and hosts sharing a range of opinions and ideals. We are united in our love for America and the support of our Constitution. Spreely TV is your source for some of the country's best thinkers and storytellers. Our team is dedicated to taking the news of the day, to learn lessons of history, and keeping an eye on the future of America and turning it into the most thought-provoking and engaging programs available anywhere. Welcome to your new home on here on Spreely TV. And you can find Spreely on... Hey, guys. uh, Our guest is coming in right now. Our guest is coming in. Sam, hold on one second, brother. We got you. Okay, you can see me then? Not Uh, yet. We can hear you. We can hear you. But uh, let's... uh, The Freedom Hub... Uh, you can download there the there he is. You can download the Freedom Hub app, my man. Or download the Freedom Hub app right to your smartphone, smart device. The concept behind the Freedom Hub is simple. We became fed up with woke news media, woke businesses, and woke entertainers. The woke social media platforms. We remember an America that was strong, hospitable to all races and creeds, and people were proud to say they were Americans. A place we love thy neighbor, respect thy law, and fought for our rights, protected by the U.S. Constitution. Via the Freedom Hub, you can access all of Spreely Media's platforms and American First Influencers, publishers, businesses, and supporters who have all have one common goal, to ensure that freedom does not die during our generation in America. And again, you can download the Freedom Hub app to your smart devices. Go right into the App Store, type in Freedom Hub, and it is absolutely free. It costs you nothing, and it helps support podcasts just like this. All right, with that being said, Matty, uh, if you wouldn't mind, sir, yeah. Uh, well, before we bring in the guests real quick, I just want to make mention of your shirt. I noticed your T-shirt here. And it says, uh, what's that say? It says, Winston Churchill was a piece of shit. There you go. All right. All right. So why don't you bring the in the boomers are going to like that why one. Why don't you bring in our guest here? Hey, uh, Sam Parker. Okay, so we our guest today is Sam Parker. Sam Parker ran for the U.S. Senate against Mitt Romney on a platform of making American government local again. He... He's had a professional career that has spanned biotech research and development, banking, and even includes a short stint in Major League Baseball. He currently splits his time between Salt Lake City, Utah, and his childhood hometown in Washington State. Sam Parker, welcome to the Burn Pit Podcast. How are you doing, brother? Good. How are you guys? Good, Good. man. Yeah, so Sam, real quick. Um, I learned about you, obviously. I got to know you through following Lucas Gage when I got on Twitter, and I started following a bunch of other people, uh, including Jake Shields and Keith Woods, and, you know, I've always followed Ryan Dawson, uh, but... Um, what I want you to do real quick is, because we're already a half hour into the podcast, but I, what I want you to do briefly is I want you to kind of introduce yourself to the, to the listening and viewing audience uh, and basically how you got to the point where you are now, ideologically speaking, when it comes to politics and what's going on in the world and our country. 
today because i i know you are from out you're out west and i know that's a liberal area and you're very conservative just like we are but if you can just do a quick rundown of your life and how you got to be where you're at now ideologically go ahead brother yeah so uh you know i start i well first of all i appreciate you having me on yeah uh, lucas keith uh, ryan dawson jake shields all great guys everybody should follow them obviously on social media we're uh, we're all active on Twitter, except for Lucas right now. Of course, he got banned for yeah. three months. So yeah. we're trying to keep his memory alive on there. But uh, <laughs> he's working hard on Telegram and Instagram and he's on Rumble too. And Rumble. Yeah. So, um, so I appreciate you guys having him on and boosting him as well. You know, we're, we try to, you know, speak with a unified voice and work as a team because that really helps amplify the message, right? When you have a team, you're so much more powerful than you are as, a, as an atomized individual. Yeah. Right. And and I guess that will lead into what I want to say about myself politically and where I where I came to be now. You know, as I get older, I get more radical. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I get more radical, more hardcore as I get older. And I realize that, yeah, I, I do believe in radical individualism. Absolutely. But with a cooperative team around you, you know, uh, because in this world, unfortunately, we are beset by people who collectivize to squash us like bugs. Yep. And if we remain as atomized individuals, then we will get squashed. And so I think people, we people that are on the right are playing from an inherent disadvantage, you know, compared to our counterparts on the left who have a predilection for teaming up, for uniting, for collectivizing. Because we just want to be left alone, right? Yep. Especially like liber- people who are libertarian minded, they just they just want to be left alone. Conservatives, we just want to be individuals, you know. So we are at a natural disadvantage. We're, you know, we we show up to a, a basketball game, you know, and our team's five guys who have never even seen each other before, whereas their team's been practicing, you know, twelve hours a day every day for ten years, and they got plays, yep. you know, and and you know, and so you've ever, if you've ever played some pickup basketball against a squad of guys who plays together all the time, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm talking yeah, about, yep. and that's 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 what we're dealing with, right? So. You know, so I've evolved in my political thinking. I grew up in a conservative household. My parents listened to Rush Limbaugh starting in the late 80s, early 90s. So I listened to Rush Limbaugh, yeah. right? And Same. so yep. I had those productions. I remember Ronald Reagan. I remember listening to his speeches on TV and being wowed by Ronald Reagan. So he was sort of a childhood hero, you know. So, you know, the Gipper, he's, he's the hero of, of many conservatives. As you get older, you begin to see the mistakes that he made yep. and the missteps that he took, yep. and you know, and 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 you know, the gleam is sort of knocked off, if you will, uh, and he becomes a, a politician, uh, almost no better or worse than many of the others. Correct. Certainly good and great in many respects, not so great in other respects. Uh, but anyway, that's where I started, right? And I sort of remained there more or less as a sort of standard conservative throughout the, you know, from the 80s up until the the late 2000s. I, you know, before, you know, pre-2010. In 2010, I made a, a fateful decision. I canceled my cable. So I stopped watching Fox News. I stopped <laughs> watching cable news. I stopped watching all that. And I think that that was helpful in terms of allowing me to um, give room to different viewpoints and different ideas outside of the conservative mainstream. Yeah. Right. And so fast forward a few years from there, my thinking's already changing because I'm not absorbing just the cable news, you know, uh, you know, mockingbird operation uh, constantly. Yeah. Uh, And I got on Reddit. I'm like, what's this Reddit thing, you know, and in the mid 20 teens and I made my first, I made an account on Reddit. I made my first post and I got censored on my very first post. And it wasn't even a political post. It wasn't even a political post, guys. It was a college football. I was such a normie. I was so into sports. And by the way, I'm wearing my Washington Husky sweatshirt because the Washington Huskies are playing in the college football national championship tonight. Okay. So go Huskies, go dogs. There you go. Uh, but anyway, total normie. I, you know, I, I worked for the Chicago Cubs years ago. I played sports growing up, really into sports. Anyway, I made a college football post in the college football forum and it, it got censored. It got deleted by the mods. They didn't like something about it. And I'm like, what? So like immediately I Googled alternatives to Reddit and I discovered a website called vote. 
which at the time was a, a completely uncensored free speech version of Reddit. Absolutely legendary to anybody who's been online for a long time looking for places to, you know, speak freely. It was sort of right up there with 4chan, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and Gab, you know, back in the day. Uh, it was killed on Christmas Day just a little over two years ago. Very tragic, very yeah. sad. Uh, but anyway, I got on vote as sort of this uh, evolving, normie conservative, but starting to get new inclinations. And I started getting exposed to things that they don't like you being exposed to. Yes. And within yes. you know just a few months of being on there, I, was, I started scratching my chin. I'm like, oh, that's 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 interesting. And after about six months, I. I was almost the version of me that you see today. <laughs> so that's, that's the power of free speech, right? When when ideas can flow freely and you can uh, you can touch those forbidden subjects. Yeah, and and Sam, real quick, because I want to bring that up. Actually, is I have noticed, and this is just me personally in my own personal environment here in Pittsburgh. I've noticed that Gen Z teenagers are actually more woke to what we talk about on Twitter, okay, than anybody my age or older, especially, I mean, boomers are gone. As far as I'm concerned, the boomer generation, they're too, they're too far. They've been brainwashed too long. They've been conditioned yeah. too long, right? They're not going to, you show them hardcore evidence, they're not going to change their mind. I agree. No. These kids, however, and I'm trying to analyze this in my head, Sam, I'm not talking about these kids are talking about David Irving and uh, watching certain documentaries. And I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that they were telling me this stuff. This is a 17 year old kid. Two, well, two, both of them are 17. And yeah. I'm like, all your friends like this? Well, yeah, the ones I hang out with, we all discuss this. Ready for this? They're in high school, they have no careers. They have no children. They're not married. They literally have nothing to lose, right? right? And also, this information has probably been out, to your point, in the late teens. However, it only started really gaining traction in the past few years. And because of the ex-Twitter... Now, say what we want about Elon. He has cucked a little bit. But he allows pretty much a lot of stuff to be viewed. And that being said... These kids who are going to watch, you, you, this stuff starts to spread after so many years. Yeah. More and more people are waking up. However, the, the, G, the Gen Z teens have nothing to lose. So they, they're comfortable talking about it. What do you think yeah, about they, it? They don't, yeah, no, they absolutely, you're absolutely right. They have nothing to lose. Uh, they, their future is way out there in front of them, right? Yeah. And, and they've grown up with the internet. They've grown up with being able to you know, shit post and edge post and say whatever they want and do yeah. stupid jokes and, and, and what, whatever, right. On all these various in platforms, you know, it seems like every other year a new app or a new platform arises and gets popular and then goes away in a new one. Yeah. And so they're always looking for something new for something fresh right now. TikTok's the, the behemoth, yep. right. And what's interesting on TikTok is they are so driven, you know, these content creators, first of all, some, I saw a statistic last year, something like one third of all, Zoomers want to be influencers when they grow up. That's what they want to do. Like, you know, yeah. when they grow up, I mean, they're already yeah. doing it, of course, but that's what they, one third, they want to just be online and be an influencer. That's crazy. So there's this tremendous drive for content. Yeah. And, and I mean, you guys do a podcast. You're looking, you're always looking for people to yep. have on. You're looking for content to talk about. So you know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about content uh, yeah. creation, right? And so what, what that creates is this massive pressure and this massive wave forward moment, uh, forward momentum of what's the next topic? What's the latest topic? What's the new thing that's not being discussed? What can we discuss? Where can we go? Where hasn't been gone yet, right? And so we saw that at the beginning of this of this latest uh, conflict between uh, Israel and Gaza, right? As that erupted in early October, uh, what you saw was uh, Twitter just went wild. Yeah. Uh, and, and Harrison Smith of Infowars. Yep. Uh, you know, talk. He 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 made one of the classic tweets in the last three months, in my opinion, and that was he. It was two or three weeks in. He said he felt sorry for the minds of all the normies on Twitter who had been bombarded with twenty years worth of 4chan memes. <laughs> 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 because no, Cue. because that's literally what it was. People just started firing, firing everything they had, right? Yeah. For like all day, every day, 
and just every every people guys were going into their folders and just sharing every piece of information yeah. and meme that and video that they ever had ever you know archived for the last twenty years. Yeah, and 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 so so then that stuff started getting on to TikTok, right? Started yeah. leaking out to TikTok, and you had uh, the dancing Israelis from nine eleven going viral on TikTok. Yeah, then you had the letter to Bin Laden going viral on TikTok. Yeah. And and I was in a chat. I'm in, a, in several chat groups on Twitter, but in one of my chat groups, we were talking about this, and I remarked that, you know, we could literally be two weeks away from full on Holocaust denial on on TikTok because, like, that's how quickly the the narrative was advancing. I mean, you're going from you know, like, oh, I I, I support Israel's right to self defense. And, and then within like a week or two, now it's like, Dan, I support the, you know, what's up with the dancing Israelis? And then a few days later, it's the letter to bin Laden. And, and, and like, it was, it was, things were moving so yeah. fast. I'm like, you know, Holocaust denial is like two weeks away. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, again, it's, it's the content finally making its rounds. A yeah. lot of this content has been around for years, but... Because it's been censored on every platform. Everywhere. You're not seeing this on Facebook. You're definitely not seeing it on YouTube, right? I mean, Dawson's been banned on, like, everything. And he's you you banned. know, yeah. yeah, he's yeah. the one. Isn't he the one who started the Dancing Israelis website? Was that Dawson? Uh, he may have, or he may have helped popularize it. I well, regardless, he has the yeah. documentary um, War by Deception, right? Yes. Which yes, more and more people... Work. Yeah. Are, yeah right so real quick because we want to we, we're limited time we were discussing earlier me and scotty this whole epstein stuff right uh, so yeah. so two questions first one is he said they're going to release the client list number one how the fuck are we going to know if that's the legitimate client list i mean come on they're hold on to it for three years now we're going to trust you're going to give us the legitimate list um number two notice how never ever before for the most part sam Nobody ever talked about the Mossad operation, this whole, you know, uh, uh, blackmail honeypot stuff until now. Now you have people right. like Charlie Kirk talking about this being a, a, a Mossad, Epstein being a Mossad uh, asset. So, so now you have uh, no one in mainstream is talking about the Mossad asset, right? No one's talking about him, Epstein, working for the Mossad uh, for the most part. It's all about the client list and the names. And number two, again... How do we know, Sam, if the if the list is even going to be legitimate when they give it to us? Yeah, well, you know, those are great questions. I'll start out by saying that it's really interesting how society's bifurcated because if you're on Twitter, uh, we're talking. You know, if you're on certain forms of Twitter, we're talking about the Mossad connection hardcore, and we have been for weeks and months, right? right. For a long time, uh, even years uh, in Correct. some cases. But I, I, and on Gab. Uh, the free speech platform gab and you know and so there in those quarters that's been talked about for a long time but every but you know if you get on tv like i you know they aren't they aren't talking about it so there's this complete bifurcation there's yep. twin worlds and i should say since we brought up uh ryan dawson he's going to be leading helping lead a twitter space this afternoon uh going deep into all the the whole epstein story so if anybody's on twitter and you're interested in this uh he's a top you know, yep. you can consider him a top world world expert on the whole Epstein affair. That's going to be on Twitter Spaces this afternoon. So, yeah, so look awesome. for that. And Leslie but, Wexner needs to be brought up. I hope he brings him up a lot. Yeah. But go ahead. But but to your point about how we how do we you know the first point about like they just they're focusing on the names and not the connections. Yeah. And I'll go even one step past that. So yes, obviously uh, the all roads seem to lead to Israel and the Mossad. There's so many roads that lead there. You know, Les Wexner. Uh, Jelaine Maxwell, Robert Maxwell, Charles Bronfman, uh, you know, uh, John Luc Burnett, Burnell. Uh, well, actually, he was know. French. He was French. Well, he's French, but he was a Zionist Jew. I, oh, say, I didn't I, know I that. Know what okay. I, I don't know what platforms were on here, but uh, no, this uh, is free speech. I use the bell right. just so our YouTube page stays up for as long as we can. Oh, okay, <laughs> but but but, I but get you, yeah, but I want to get you guys the platform. You know, so yeah. that's all. But but my point is, is there's like so many connections, and you can go on down the list yeah. of of all of them, right? And so that's the next step beyond like who's on the list. Well, who was he working for? Who was he doing these blackmail honey trap operations for? But the but but that even that doesn't go far enough because that still misses the point of like why were they doing it yeah and what were they actually accomplishing by blackmailing these people what to what end were they blackmailing them and extorting them that's like that's really where the meat and potatoes are and so you know they got the tapes 
They got the videos. Those have never been released. I contend that those are worth trillions of dollars. Oh, yeah, I, you can't even put a price on it. Trillions of dollars. The, these tapes and videos are worth trillions of dollars because they determine whether or not countries go to war or don't go to war or stop committing genocides, right? Yep. I mean, so th these, uh, I mean... I mean, it's quite possible that that Israel's getting away with its genocide of Gaza right now, yeah, because of these tapes. I mean, that's so that's no that's no small thing, you know. So I just want to impress that upon people. What is it at the end of the day? Th this blackmail and extortion was being used for something. It was, yes, the sex trafficking happened. The sex trafficking of children happened. Horrible, grisly crimes. Yeah, but those were being used to, faci to facilitate bigger crimes. Yep. And nobody's talking about those. I'll yeah. just give you a quick example. Uh, Jelaine Maxwell, we know, was a secret <laughs> undercover uh, um, moderator on Reddit for 15 yeah. years. She was the number, uh, she was, in 2011, Gizmodo called her the most viral person on the internet. They didn't know it was her at the time. They just knew of her alter online alter ego. Yeah. What was she doing for 15? She was moderating some of the biggest subreddits in the world. Some of the most influential internet pages in the world. She moderated the World News page, and and um, I mean all sorts of things. Yeah. And she, you know, so she was curating information. She was shaping minds. Uh, just a few a few weeks before she, or a few days even before she was arrested, the Donald subreddit you guys might remember is like one of the most dominant pages. You know, behind, supporting. Uh, President Trump yeah. uh, was nuked along with 2,000 other subreddits uh, uh, like a week before she was arrested. Did she have a role in that? Did she help deplatform Trump and all of the you know Trump movement off of Reddit? You know, and this begs the question: you know, could she have been helping run a worldwide child trafficking blackmail ring and doing a full time Reddit moderator job for 15 years? Probably not. She had to have teams of people behind her. Yeah. So nobody's looked into this beyond like, oh, yeah, Jelaine Maxwell you know, you know, has really gone un into this beyond that. But like how much how far have they penetrated our social media and our Internet and our information infrastructure? What was to, the name of the Israeli group that was doing that? Uh, Unit 82. That's right. Unit 82. 82. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but yeah, so so she's so they quite possibly were involved, right? So nobody, her twin sisters Christine and Isabel were involved in, uh, uh, you know, building. You know, you might have heard of the the database that the FBI put together after nine eleven uh, to bring together all the different intelligence yeah. uh, information from all the different agencies, right? You uh, in the early two thousands. Guess who built that for them? Christine uh, Maxwell, her yeah. sister. Wow. Like, I mean, so, oh, and, and, you know, and we don't have time to keep going into it, but the point is, is this family, her father, Robert Maxwell, yep. the Mossad super spy, he owned scientific journals, he owned newspapers, yep. uh, you know, textbooks. Yep. This this whole family is involved in the curation and the control of mass information and yep. data. What are they doing with it? And more importantly, what is Israel doing with it? You know, and so nobody's talking about that. They're all focusing on the sex crimes and who's on the list and who's not on the list. But like, what what was this? These the people being extorted? What was that facilitating? Yeah. You know, what crimes? Yeah, it's uh, again, you you're one hundred percent right. But and the sad part is not everyone's talking about it. So the bulk of the American public, or even I don't know how it is in, in Western European countries, but there are a lot of people are oblivious to this. And even if you bring it up, it's uncomfortable to even acknowledge or accept and these people yeah. like they're my again boomers are the worst but it's very hard for people to accept these things well what do you got scotty well i i don't know if i uh we have time to ask the questions about uh, his bio because i was curious oh yeah go ahead real quick yeah if you don't if you don't mind sir uh i'd like to in your i've got all the time you guys need uh, so well we only got 10 minutes left, about but 10 minutes left but it's okay. this is off your platform for senate yeah ahead. so i'm i'm i was reading uh, your twitter bio i follow you on uh twitter and uh in your uh, Twitter bio, uh, it's or X bio, it says, repeal the 16th, 17th, 19th, and 26th Amendment and the Immigration Act of 1965. Now, the 16th Amendment, I'm aware of, is the income tax. The 17th Amendment, though, it, if you wouldn't mind breaking that down uh, a little bit, and then the 19th and the 26th, the voting age, I'm curious, is you think the voting age should be uh, increased, I'm guessing. I, I, I Yeah, so I'll start in reverse to address the voting. Okay. Listen, 
our government was set up to protect our rights. That's the most important goal, to protect our rights and to prevent tyranny from arising. That's the most important goal of the way our constitutional government was structured. So our founders very carefully structured a government uh, in different pieces and gave different groups of people and different constituencies sort of power and say over these different parts, right? And sort of this interlocking checks and balances, you know, uh, 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 structure. And, and that was to, make, to prevent tyranny from arising and protect our rights. So that's the number one goal. So this idea that everybody has to have a say in everything, if that works against, you know, if that allows tyranny to arise, then that's not a good thing. Right. That's because number one is we got to prevent tyranny. We got to protect our rights. And if that means people, certain people and other people can't vote for this thing or that thing or the other thing, then we should take a hard look at that. Uh, because, you know, giving everybody a voice is how they've been able to subvert our Constitution and subvert our government and actually allows tyranny to arise and, and overthrow our rights. So I'll give you I'll give you an example. You asked about the 17th Amendment. What the 17th Amendment did is it took the senators away from uh, the state legislatures and made them directly elected by the people. So the Senate now is just another legislature, just like the House of Representatives. Like, it's literally the same thing, only instead of serving for two years, they serve for six years. And instead of there being 435 of them, there's 100 of them, right? But other, other than that, they're exactly the same thing. Uh, and the same constituency uh, votes for both of them, right? Mm -hmm. The people vote for both. But how it used to be is the Senate represented the states. So the state legislatures selected the senators, OK, and this is a really, really important point, it turns out uh, that it's really hard to explain, but I'll try to do it in a couple of minutes. What this means is that in order to buy the influence of a senator, you had to buy the influence of an entire state legislature. So think about that. So now what you like APAC, like, you know, uh, and these other lobbies, the Israeli lobby, they, they can buy up these politicians. Right. And you you can buy up 50 or 60 senators. No problem. Right. But. But what if you have to buy up 26 or 30 state legislatures? You know, that's what you have to do now. That's what you had to do. Uh, and that became very expensive, very prohibitive, very next to impossible. So it turns out that, you know, uh, Senate elections, there wasn't a lot of money involved in Senate senatorial elections before the 17th Amendment. Almost no money at all because it was just a, an internal thing amongst the state legislature. They would select uh, two people to go be a senator. And if they didn't perform in Washington, D.C. the way they wanted them, well, they just wouldn't get reelected and the state legislature would send uh, better representatives the next time. And what this means is that, so this took money out of the Senate. Like, there wasn't money in those elections. So what it also did is it kept money out of the House of Representatives because, okay, yeah, I can maybe buy this representative. I can buy this representative, but it's worthless to me because if I if I don't have the Senate to go along with them, it's, it's worthless. So what it did is, so... So uh, the elections for House of Representatives were also very, you know, a lot less money involved, were a lot less important because you had two completely separate constituencies. You had the state legislatures and then the, the people, and they were different constituencies, right? Right. And anyway, so uh, that was called bicameralism and, and federalism. And what that did is it kept money out of politics, like way, there was way less money in it than there is now. And then the other thing is, is that, States had a direct a hand on the levers of power in Washington, D.C. Like states had a say over the federal budget. States had a say over whether we went to war or not. States had a say over the Supreme Court justices. States had a say over foreign treaties. Right. States had a say in all of these things, whereas now states don't have a say in anything. The best they can do is take the federal government to court. Uh, to the Supreme Court, which happens to be part of the federal government, and hope that the Supreme Court will maybe side with the state instead of its cronies in the federal government. Right. See, so, so, so that the Seventeenth Amendment absolutely obliterated uh, the structure of our federal government. And in fact, uh, uh, what happened, if you think about it, the federal government seceded from the states with the Seventeenth Amendment mm. because the Senate. The, the states controlling the Senate was how the states who created the federal government in the first place, that's how they maintained control over the federal government was through the Senate. But once they severed that connection and the state legislatures no longer had control over the Senate, literally what happened, the federal government seceded from the states. That's what happened. But didn't the states kind of accept that and didn't do well, anything yeah. about it? They were kind of on board with that? People were fooled. They didn't understand. Yeah. Like they were sold this, like, oh, uh, everybody needs to have a say in who their senators are. Everybody yeah. needs to have a vote. And 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 so it was. You know, it was 
back in the early 20th century and people were fooled. They're like, yeah, yeah, we want to have a vote. We want to be able to say who our senator is. And so they were fooled. And now in hindsight, we see how it's destroyed things and how the, it's turned a federal government. Uh, it's brought money into the uh, into it. It's it's uh, it's it's out of control, right? So that's why I want to repeal it. I want to put the federal government Broke back in check. Yeah, I wouldn't Broke mind so much the money going into it because I'm a huge advocate of the Second Amendment. I believe if the states, or I'm sorry, the government officials, whether it's a senator, a, a representative, whoever, even on a local level, state level, county level, uh, you know. I believe the Second Amendment takes care of that if the people just shoot them in the face. We got, we got and I'm not trying to be funny. I'm being dead serious. I mean, that is why it's there. But, hey, we're limited we on got, time. We got, so go ahead. we got five minutes five left. Minutes. Why don't we, do, we read the... Okay, so, Sam, at the end of the show, and, and, I, and, I, and I wish you came on earlier, but that's okay. I, I, you're a busy we, man. We appreciate it. Thanks for joining we do, us. Uh, Thank you, sir. We, we, did, we, I, 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 did we just have a scheduling mix-up? Did I get it wrong? Did I just get it wrong? I said 4, p, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I don't know. It's I'm sorry, guys. That's okay. Good. I know there's it's a three-hour difference. So Don't what worry. we do is we play games at the end. Somehow I got in my head it was one thirty. And that's, just, that's yeah. all right. We do like a word association at the end of the um, yeah, uh, 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 a, a podcast we, and yeah, we do a word association game and occasionally Matt will do the guess that quote or guess who said that quote. Uh, so with the word association game is we would say like we played it with Lucas Gage. You know, we gave him certain cabinet members of uh, the Biden administration, and we were ringing the bell an awful lot. Uh, so here with Matt, uh, he what he likes to do is he likes to re read uh, a quote and then who said it, or say the quote of the guy, uh, or say the guy and then four different quotes, you have to guess who the right quote was. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, so this is not a, a quote game. What we're doing is it's a question, okay? I'm going to ask you some uh, American history questions to both of you. He doesn't know what they are. I want you okay. to give me the answer if you know it, okay? Okay. So, Sam, American history questions. You ready? Okay. What war and during what battle was the national anthem written? That would be the Battle of Baltimore, the War of 1812. Good job. Wow. Good <laughs> job, Sam. <laughs> All right, we're going to go to you again, Sam. You have the board. I've been there, by the way. It's a great place. Oh, uh, that's cool. That's wow. cool. How many men signed the Declaration of Independence? Oh, shoot. Was it 56? What's your answer? Oh, boy. Uh, I, I was going to say, my original thought before we said anything was 35. So. 56 is correct. Wow. Sam, that's you're awesome. the man. Very, well, very wow. nice. Wow. Okay, Sam, you ready? What president signed the prohib What president signed prohibition into law? Uh, she was that Woodrow Wilson. Well, or is it we've talked about this. Hardy. You already know the answer. Yeah. I gave it. Yeah. It's I a trick Hardy. question, Sam. It's a oh, trick. Wait, well, hold on. It was ratified here, so he doesn't sign it into law. That's yeah, it was, well. It, that's correct. It was a a veto proof majority. But Wilson right. was president, but he didn't sign yeah. it. Yeah. Good job, Sam. Good job. Okay. <laughs> as a child, ready? As a child. Which president was giving a slash across his face from the sword of a British soldier, leaving a scar when he refused to polish the soldier's boots? Oof. Well, my first impression um, is Washington. But okay, Scotty? It's got to be one of the, I would say one of the first, like, five or six. Maybe, uh, oh, boy. Maybe, like, Monroe. It's Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson. That was yeah. my second guess. I was, I was waiting for him to answer, but in my head, I'm like, my next guess would be Andrew Jackson. Yeah, he had an extreme hatred for British, which is why he fought really valiantly in uh, the War of 1812. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, number five. What year was the Constitution ratified by all 13 states? Or uh, colonies. All 13 colonies. Sorry. 1789. He's right, 17. That's not correct. 1789, they got 11. But as you know of Article 7 in the Constitution, they only needed 9. They got 11. Nine. However, all 13 finally signed. Rhode Island was the last in 1791. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, that's all right. That's, these are tough. <laughs> Most people don't know this. These are, these are I should have known that. I probably did at one point. <laughs> Scott, do you think you know this one? Because we talked right. about it last time we were here with, Pete, with Peter. Yeah. What tavern, uh, uh, Sam, what tavern was used by several secret groups, including the Sons of Liberty, which headed the famous Boston Tea Party and became known uh, by historians as the headquarters of the revolution? What tavern? I, I, I know this, but it's just right on the tip of my tongue. As soon as you said the tavern, I knew exactly what you're going to ask me, and I just can't... Um 
Tongue Tavern? The Green Dragon Tavern. Yes. Okay, I think we're out of time, yeah, but go yeah. ahead. Right, well, uh, Sam Parker joined us today. Uh, he, he was an absolute pleasure, dude. Thanks for uh, coming on. We've, Listen, if you guys need me to come on again this week or whenever, I can come on again. No, we'll, we'll definitely have you on again. But, hey, d- uh, whenever we end the show, I don't want you to hang up. I want you to stay on. I'm going to talk you offline for a little bit. All right. All right. Well, folks, you're watching us on the Spreely Network. Thank you to Spreely TV. Happy New Year to everybody. We hope everyone had a happy New Year and a Merry Christmas. Appreciate you watching, tuning in. Uh, join us next week. We'll be joined by Alan Zabrowski. Alan Zabrowski. All right, guys. Good stuff. Thank you again. We're out of here. Bye. See you. Thank you for taking the time to watch us. If you like this episode and you'd like to watch another one, click here. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks.